was thrilled when, when our incredible guest tonight came out and started campaigning for me way back in Iowa before the caucuses because I love the message. When you get knocked down, which everybody does, what matters is get back up. Stand up for what you believe. Know the power of your own voice. It can change the world. And let's once and for all, as we welcome her to the stage, let's prove that love trumps hate. Katy Perry! Here with our panel, as you're watching this, Van says Hillary is dancing. I'm for it. I'm for it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, but that was a, this is a big look. Katy Perry is a very, very crucial millennial surrogate. Yeah. She's been active for Hillary Clinton. And, this is a big night. And for she's a she's a feminist icon for the millennial generation. And I think that's really important. You know, we sometimes forget this is history. I mean, we do have a woman who could become president of the United States. That's a big deal. But for the younger millennials, they tend to take it for granted. Uh, but she is a, a, a millennial feminist icon, and again, she's transferring that cool. There it is, that hug. There was a transfer. I saw about the two percent uh, more let's, cool. Let's be honest. The, 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 cool. the, the transfer only goes so far. I mean, the you know, she had she had Katy Perry and Lena Dunham working their tails off out in Iowa during the caucuses to try to stop the yeah. Bernie Sanders mm -hmm. Sanders momentum, and it you know it barely worked. I mean this. You know, gets it gets a little bit of buzz, and but how many deliver. people are there just for the concert? I, I just have to ask. You know, last time we saw Jay Z and Beyonce together, Secretary Clinton came out. There were people already starting to leave the hallway. I mean, a lot of these folks are here just to but see this say, great concert. And I will say to you, a lot of people go to the Donald Trump uh, uh, events because of that excitement, because of that energy. You guys say but you're they don't leave, but but you can say that you're converting uh, voters. Maybe you are, maybe you aren't. But I tell you what, uh, when you have someone like her. And we're talking about it. we're showing it right now Hillary Clinton rallies. I mean that is, that gets out there. There are people in airports right now. There are people in bars right now. They look up, they see that it does transfer. But the, how the can that be? Because you have to have Katy Perry we, we to do it. Have the same no, no, you no, would Donald Trump gets on his own. You, you guys have Chachi, so that's what your problem. But we're not showcasing them. But <laughs> yeah, enough, for good you know, the, the main thing that they try to do here is they try to organize. They try to basically get all these people in who may just be there to see Katy Perry, but they're able to give them literature to give you know give them the polling places. It has some useful effect. It just doesn't, so, just doesn't so convert. So to quote some great liberals in the last few years told me, guess what? Large rallies don't necessarily translate into voters. I think a couple of times <laughs> that's been said to me over the last nine months. I will say though, Jackie, Brianna Keeler, who's at this concert right now, has told us there's a lot of suburban mothers there. They're with their daughters, yeah. some too young to vote. Uh, but, and certainly a lot of that is Katy Perry, but a lot of that is, is the suburban women voters that Hillary Clinton needs to vote. Absolutely. And I also wanted to remark on what Katy Perry walked out to, which is <laughs> Janet Jackson's song. And it's not just because uh, Janet Jackson is amazing. It's because they reclaimed the nasty woman remark that Donald Trump made. And they've done a really, I mean, it's one thing they've done a really incredible job at is, is taking that and owning it and making it part of the campaign and really um, you know, using it as a term of empowerment rather than the kind of dig that it was made and, to. And, and as we watch uh, Katy Perry, I will say Donald Trump is now actually on the stage in Reno, Nevada, so let's listen in to him the for a few FBI minutes. The FBI has reopened its criminal investigation into Hillary Clinton following the discovery of another 650,000 emails probably including the 33,000 emails that Hillary destroyed after receiving a congressional subpoena. They are also... Folks, 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 
she shouldn't be allowed to run. Okay, sure. And I'm not talking about what happened last Friday. I'm talking about right now. She shouldn't be allowed to run. When you look at General Cartwright, four-star general, for doing almost nothing by comparison, could serve five years in jail. That happened two weeks ago. General Petraeus destroyed their lives for doing nothing by comparison. How about the young man took pictures of his submarine? He wanted to have some pictures. The submarine's not like it's a brand new submarine, it's many years old. They put him in jail for a year. And she does all of these different things. They're also conducting a second criminal investigation into Hillary's illegal pay-for-play corruption at the State Department. There's virtually no doubt that FBI Director Comey and the great, great special agents of the FBI will be able to collect more than enough evidence to garner indictments against Hillary Clinton and her inner circle, despite her efforts to disparage them and to discredit them. If she were to win this election, it would create an unprecedented constitutional crisis. In that situation, we could very well have a sitting president under felony indictment and ultimately a criminal trial. It would grind government to a halt. Of course, that's what we have right now under Obama anyway. We need a government that can work and work well from day one for the American people. That will be impossible with Hillary Clinton, the prime suspect in a massive, far-reaching criminal investigation. Her current scandals and controversies will continue throughout her presidency and will make it virtually impossible for her to govern or lead our country. Now, I don't think it's going to matter because she's not going to win, but we'll, let's, let's go through the scenario. Later. By the way, does anybody speak better about this subject than our legendary mayor, Rudy Giuliani? Does anybody? Huh? He's the greatest. Come here. Special guy. New York was crime infested, filthy, dirty, problems all over the place. Rudy came in, he straightened it out. Straightened it out. Thank you, Rudy, for everything. If she ever got into the Oval Office, Hillary and her special interests would rob our country blind. You see what's going on. At the heart of this election is one simple question. Will our country be governed by the people or by the corrupt political class? If we win, the corrupt politicians and their special interests will lose. If they win, the American people will lose. It's just that simple. The political elites in this country have used their power to enrich themselves at your expense. They've run the government for their benefit, and they've profited from your pain. You see what's happening. And by the way, folks, you're highly sophisticated. I always say I have the smartest people. Smartest. The smartest.
And I have the most loyal people by far. And that's borne out in every poll they take. In fact, they're very worried. You know, with all the polls that are happening, we're winning all over the place. We're winning in Iowa. Just came out, we're seven points up. We're winning in Ohio. We're winning in New Hampshire. We're winning in North Carolina. I think we're going to win the great state of Pennsylvania. Based on turnout, I think we're going to win Florida. You know, right, this is Donald Trump speaking in Reno. Hillary Clinton, as you saw uh, in, in Pennsylvania right now at a Katy Perry concert, they are using every second that they can. Uh, just to, well, we came in, uh, Jack. It seems like that's done. It, 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 right now, Donald Trump is just trying to get his people out. And that is a message that has rallied his people and will get them to the polls because they don't like Hillary Clinton. They don't think she should be in office. And when they hear uh, Donald Trump say that, it makes them want to get to the polls. And of course, John, it's not just his base that, that has an issue with the emails. It's the Republican establishment. Yes. To the extent that he is trying to reach those more moderate Republicans, they're not at a rally like that tonight, but they hear those FBI, whatever he says about the FBI, sure. that... Well, again, this they resonates hear that. because it goes, it, it resuscitates all the old... Uh, issues with the Clintons, mm -hmm. fights with law enforcement, honesty, trustworthiness, the things that have been a drag on her approval ratings over the course of this campaign, the email scandal is a proxy for resuscitating all those concerns about the, the allegations um, of corruption and those culture war fights even within law enforcement during the, Clinton, the first Clinton administration. You heard there Donald Trump bringing back up the specter of an indictment, a constitutional crisis. Mm -hmm. Now, what's, what's significant about that isn't only that the crowd likes it, the surreal uh, fact that lock her up is a, has been an applause line and a, a rallying cry over the course of this campaign, but that even Trump's campaign manager, Kellyanne Conway, said earlier today that that's, that's inaccurate, right? There is no evidence or, 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 or actual reporting of, of any indictment. But she said that it doesn't matter because the damage has been done. Now, that's a deeply cynical, if honest, uh, mm -hmm. assessment of why this gets brought up over and over again. But it's going to be one of those wedges that's very difficult to, to, to heal. Okay, all staying with me and of course uh, our coverage of Election Day, Tuesday, just three days away. We are here though all night with you tonight. Next, North Carolina, the state that could turn the entire election. You heard Trump reference it. We are live in Charlotte. And Tim Kaine uh, coming out tonight, speaking of the FBI, he says some in the FBI, in his words, are actively working to help Donald Trump. Laughs along the way. Here's Jeannie Moss. From the moment Donald Trump took an escalator to announce his candidacy, campaign 2016 has escalated into laughs. From awkward air kissing to sniffing <laughs> to coughing. <coughs> Every time I think about Trump, I get allergic. The Donald's not allergic to kids. He actually signed one, but threatened to reassign a crying baby. Don't worry about that baby. I love babies. A minute later... Actually, I was only kidding. You can get the baby out of here. And then there was mini Trump. Do you want to go back to them or do you want to stay with Donald Trump? Trump. A crowd-pleasing answer till you realize mini Trump parrots the last word he hears. What's your name? Nay. And then there was the childlike delight in balloons. Hill and Bill batted and kicked them. It seemed like he'd seen balloons for the first time <laughs> in his life. I mean, look at how delighted he is. The Donald seemed delighted with his own pronunciation. Nevada. Nobody says it the other way. It has to be Nevada. Actually, Donald, wrong. This is right. Nevada. At one rally... Hey, get this thing out of here, will you? Trump attacked his teleprompter. <laughs> He publicly humiliated... Like this stupid mic. His microphone. Stupid mic keeps popping. Remember when Hillary barked into her mic? <coughs> and then this happened at a Trump rally. This is something you shouldn't... Do. What was that? Is that a dog? Hillary! 
Uh oh. <laughs> it's Hillary. When it comes to the insect vote, the Donald attracts mosquitoes. Ooh, there was a mosquito. I don't want mosquitoes around me. And Hillary appeals to flies. Any way he chooses. If only time would fly so we can get relief from the constant buzzing of the candidates. I don't like mosquitoes. Genie Mo, CNN, New York. In a tough campaign, nice to know that there were some moments everybody laughed. Thanks so much for joining us. We'll be back Monday night at 7 Eastern for another edition of Outfront on Election Eve. CNN continues next. Minnesota, Wisconsin, Michigan, Pennsylvania. This is the heart of Hillary Clinton's electoral map advantage. Take a look at the most recent poll we've seen out of Michigan. 42% to 38%. That's a four-point race in a state where Barack Obama beat Mitt Romney by nine points. This is too close for comfort for the Democrats. That's why you see so much campaign activity there. Also, out last night, a brand new Des Moines Register poll in Iowa, 46% to 39%. A seven-point lead for Donald Trump in Iowa. This causes concern not so much about Iowa, which the Clinton folks already thought was out of reach, but what else is happening around Iowa if that is happening in Iowa? Let's go to the electoral map and look at the path to 270. This is the, the current battleground map. Hillary Clinton at 268, only two shy of 270. Where does she go to find it? Well. They feel pretty good about Nevada. They think the early vote there is really good. That gets her over to 274. But this is what's critical. If Donald Trump is able to dig into a place like Michigan, look at that. It drops Hillary Clinton down to 258. Where does she go to find the rest? She must get a big battleground prize like a Florida or a North Carolina. That would do it to get her back over, over 270. But that is going to require some work. That is why you see Barack Obama, Hillary Clinton, Bill Clinton heading to Michigan in the final days. They need to keep fortifying that blue wall. Jake? So just how worried should Democrats be? With me here, our panel, CNN Chief Political Correspondent Dana Bash, RNC Communications Director and Chief Strategist Sean Spicer, former Democratic Governor of Michigan Jennifer Granholm, CNN Political Commentators Van Jones and Alice Stewart, and we're going to bring back CNN Political Director David Chalian. Governor, I'm starting with you. Start. What's going on in Michigan? Is Hillary Clinton going to be able to pull it out? It sounds like it's really tight. Barack Obama's going there, so obviously they're nervous. I know, it's awesome. It's awesome. I mean, usually <laughs> Michigan is like, scam. you know, it's <laughs> It's totally great. It's Everybody awesome. on the ground it's is awesome so excited. It's awesome that the president has to be deployed to Michigan. <laughs> no, it's just, I agree. <laughs> it's awesome. We, we love all of the attention. We really do. But here's what I would say is that a lot of what has not been covered is that Michigan has early absentee voting. And in that early absentee vote, Democrats have banked 50,000 absentee votes, meaning they're over what the Republicans have. In fact, the number of absentee votes that we are seeing right now is well over what it was in 2020. 12 for Democrats. So we're feeling good about that bank. And um, we also know that, you know, election day is going to be key. So I, I would say one other thing that I think it's important to realize, Michigan's demographics are, are very interesting because you do have a large Arab American population and you do have a significant Latino population as well. So when you combine African American, Latino, uh, Arab American and women and millennials, the millennial vote for the even in early is up, we're, we're encouraged. Well, Sean, I, I wouldn't want to put my money in that bank. Well, let me, let me ask you, what's, right, what's going on here? Let's make a bet right now, man. Okay, right now. Now. Right now. Governor, since 1988, a Republican hasn't carried Michigan. The idea that you're deploying the President of the United States 48 hours from an election to go to Michigan says that that blue wall has cracked well, big time. Iowa big time. hasn't been carried, was carried twice by Obama. Seven point lead, according to the Des Moines He's, Register. But, but state Trump after state. Trump is not ahead in Michigan. Hey, Trump Jay. has not been ahead in then Michigan. Then why in, you're in wasting the President of the United States' time then? Tell him to go somewhere else. Dan, now, why is the president going to Michigan? Because, this, maybe because Democrats shopping. in Michigan who are not on television when they don't have to, to be, with all due respect, uh, to be very positive, positive yeah. are saying, and I've talked to some yesterday, that they're very worried. That they're very worried because it is I, narrow and they don't want to take any chances. Well, and that's, that's for sure. You don't want to take yeah, any yeah, chances. Speaking of awesome, to the governor's point, what's really awesome is two weeks ago, Hillary Clinton was leading in Michigan by 13 points. Slowly it's gone from 8 to 6 to 5. Now she's only four points ahead in a state where Democrats have won that since 1988. And speaking of on the air, Hillary's putting $2 million on the air in Michigan. That, in addition to President Obama being there, they're worried. What's going on? 
beds are damp. In <laughs> well, Democrats are wetting their beds. Democrats are wetting their beds. In general. Hey, but that's a four-point hey, lead. Hey, that's hey, too, that's hey, within the margin of error. That's hey, scary hey, for hey, Democrats. Absolutely. And I'll tell you why. There is a crack in the blue wall, and it has to do with trade. This is this is the ghost of Bernie Sanders. Yep. There is there is a discontent with some Democratic voters over trade, and some blame Hillary Clinton. And so you've got to go back there and and, and shore back up. But here's the reality: there is a, a clear case to be made, and is being made by Democrats to come to stay home, come here. Listen, you don't like where the bus is going. You don't let a drunk guy drive the bus to to solve the problem. But but listen, we, there's no point pretending that there, there's not some some some, some concern here. And, and let's, David, let me just let me just let me just say. It makes sense that if there is concern mm -hmm. that white working class voters who are supporting Trump overwhelmingly in Iowa and Ohio, two states where Donald Trump is favored, are really surging and really showing him strong support, why wouldn't they show up in Michigan? That's right. And I also think this speaks, and Sean probably can speak more to this than anybody else at the table here, but to the power of big data right now, because what is happening is, and this is both sides, right? I mean, Robbie Mook said Michigan is tightening. He sees it. Uh, Robbie the, Mook, the Clinton campaign The Clinton campaign manager. manager. The Republicans have absolutely, on the Trump data side, also seen Michigan as a target closing at the end. And what you can do when you have all this data coming in, make these last minute decisions. Exactly. That's why in the final week, Bill Clinton twice, Hillary Clinton twice, Barack Obama once. That kind of firepower would not be sent to Michigan no, I, unless everybody no, was seeing no, no, there's, And there's no question that the polls have been tightening. I don't want to be, you know, completely Pollyanna about it. But I would say to your point, Van, in that very poll that you described where she's four points up, she gets better marks on trade than he does by four points because people have seen what she has said. Bernie Sanders has been there campaigning for her, and she really has been very clear about wanting to renegotiate. Now, while we're talking about while we're talking about Bernie Sanders, I want to bring in this uh, this uh, uh, this tape of a student introducing Bernie Sanders. I believe it was in in Iowa uh, on November fifth, uh, and he actually has to be escorted off the stage by Clinton's Iowa communications director. Take a look. She is so trapped in the world of the elite that she has completely lost grip of what it's like to be an average person. She doesn't care. Voting for another lesser of two people, there's no point. Oops. Got the millennial vote all locked up, huh? <laughs> Oops. Listen, um, <laughs> that wasn't is good. Awesome. That wasn't good. And you can't spin that. But here's, but here's the reality. Um, you do have a bunch of young folks who still have heartburn and they have rug burn from the from the primary. Mm -hmm. And I think there was a view that I think was a mistaken view that the uh, young Sanders voters would act in 2016 the same way that Hillary Clinton's voters yep. acted in 2008. They would come home easily. And in fact, that has not turned out to be the case. And yet, what you're seeing now is a millennial surge. When you look at Funny or Die, when you look at all the, the pop icons that are coming out, it's actually starting now to be cool to be for Hillary Clinton. And that's going to make a big difference on Tuesday. I think that this election needs to be kept in perspective. Two months ago, it was going to be electoral disaster for Republicans. We weren't going to keep the Senate. We potentially could lose the House. Now we are going to keep the Senate unequivocally. I feel very good about that. <laughs> but look at, look at, listen, hold on. But look at wow. what the states that we're competing in. Every know, single one of them is said. one that Barack Obama won twice. Florida, Ohio, North Carolina, yes, Romney got that one. But Iowa, New Hampshire, Nevada, Pennsylvania, Michigan, yeah. Wisconsin. We have opened and widened this map like never before. So it's not just Michigan. It's North Carolina. And it's where they're putting their time and their money. They recognize that we have widened the map. They are on defense. Robbie Mook should put the fireworks away because I think it's going to be a late night. And I think that the momentum in every single one of those states, bar none, is with Donald Trump and the Republicans. Nah. First of all, the, the Senate, that was a, a pretty uh, bold prediction. We'll see if that happens. But, 24, but, 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 but I would just say it's equivocal. Let's just say it's an equivocal. This is, this is, this is, this is what I want to say, though. On, on your point, uh, North Carolina, perfect example. I did a story on the millennial vote in North Carolina recently and there was no question actually did surprise me how much Re remaining opposition there was to Hillary Clinton and it was actually frankly people repeating back words of Bernie Sanders That's saying right. When people tell you how to vote, don't listen to them. And I said, but is Bernie Sanders now telling you that? It doesn't matter. I want to say one so, thing. So it, so it is residual. And I do think it's kind of as we get in these final hours, the fact that Donald Trump's base is coming home and his people are coming home and Hillary Clinton's having more Let me ask problems. you, Pam, before you say that, President Obama was in Fayetteville, North Carolina. 
uh, there was a nice moment where he there was a, a, a pro-Trump supporter and he shouted down the crowds, you know, listen to this man, respect this man, he's allowed to do it. But there's also a frustration you can hear in President Obama, Obama's voice in the crowd not listening to him. Take a look. Hey, everybody! Everybody! Hey! Hey! Listen up! Hey! I told you to be focused and you're not focused right now. Listen to what I'm saying. <laughs> Hey, he's not just talking about that protester there, is he, Van? <laughs> well, he's not, but let me just say two things about that. That was so amazing. First of all... He's not running. I'm just saying, <laughs> just, there's something beautiful about, about that. He was yelling because he wanted the protester, the dissenter, to be respected. Right. Not punched, not right. drug out of here on a stretcher. And, and so I think that's very, very important. The other thing is, can you imagine what would have happened if that crowd had gotten out of control? with the President of the United States standing right there if something bad had happened. And so there's a desperation there, I think, also to make sure that nothing bad happened um, on his watch. I think with regard to that, I think the way he handled that was was very respectful, pointing out the fact this was an elderly man, he was a veteran, and, a veteran. and we need to show respect. I thought that was uh, very good. But clearly he's uh, frustrated with the fact he doesn't have control. And, and in addition to that, this week, many of the speeches and interviews he's been giving is reminding folks, millennials and all, if you vote for Donald Trump, you're basically handing away my legacy. Everything that I have accomplished and done as president, he has vowed to take away. So he is not really being able to pr promote and tout Hillary's favorables, but tout and, and criticize Donald Trump because he is going to lose his legacy. And that's really his message. There is frustration with. among Democrats, and it seems from President Obama that African-American turnout is not where it was for him in 2012 and 2008. That it's that it's it's lagging. Surprise! Which, right, I mean, I, to Van's point, I don't think uh, the Clinton campaign was ever, ever counting on African-American turnout to be at the levels it was uh, for the first African-American president. Uh, and in fact, I think what you're seeing is, uh, I think we need to see what happens on Tuesday. The Latino vote may end up being a That's critical part of the storyline on Tuesday night. Uh, if, it, if it really does increase as it's over, uh, Latinos make up a much bigger share of the pie than they did four years ago. And it's one of Hillary Clinton's strongest groups in that Obama coalition. That may make up for a dip in the African-American so, vote. So I just want to come back at you on the the lack of enthusiasm. Just take two states. I mean, North Carolina, you all have been reporting that the African-American vote was down. Why, is, why was it down initially? It was because of voter suppression, that they closed down 17 counties, closed down sites, shortened hours. There was this purging of African, largely African-American votes. Now, though, over the weekend, they have seen an incredible spike. And so in 2012, Barack Obama got 23% of the African-American early vote. And here, now, it's 20, this is before all of the numbers are in from yesterday, it's 22.3% in North Carolina. In Florida, the numbers are up. You guys have been reporting that the numbers were down since 2008. But since 2012, the African-American numbers are up 22%. Hold so, on. But, 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 like, okay, so you brought up So I'm just saying, and, and, and last. Latino, let me just finish my point on yes. the Latino vote in Florida up 120 percent. So, bottom line is that okay. new America is really showing unfortunately, up. Unfortunately, Sean, Sean, uh, unfortunately, oh, I got, I'm so job, sorry. Ben. Governor, <laughs> mission accomplished for the governor. <laughs> who will win the White House based on who wins the World Series? What the Cubs win might mean for election night. That's next. Nice. Cubs are gonna win today. Go Cubs, go. State of the Union is brought to you by the Peter G. Peterson Foundation.